Now, our subject today is those who came late. And this concludes the series on the seven first words at the birth of Jesus. And in this final message, we want to consider the last two words. We have been looking at the Christmas story in a new dimension. We've been looking at the Christmas story in depth this year because we felt that it has been slighted and we need to see exactly what the Word of God has to say concerning it. The sixth word that we consider first today is the Nunc Dimittis of Simeon. It took place in the temple at Jerusalem 40 days after his birth. And to get this before us, let me refresh your mind by reading again verse 21 of the second chapter of Luke. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, who was so named by the angel before he was born. The Lord Jesus was circumcised the eighth day. And Paul makes it very clear why. He says that in the fullness of time God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, and that was at Bethlehem, born under the law, that was at Jerusalem, when he was taken there to be circumcised the eighth day. And then 33 days later, why he was brought into the temple for his dedication. This was all according to the law. Now, circumcision was given first to Abraham, and that identified him with Abraham and the covenant God made with him, and also it identified him with the nation Israel. He came unto his own, his own people, and his own things, the things of the world, received him not. And circumcision had a tremendous spiritual meaning for Israel in that day as it does for us today. It had the meaning, of course, primarily of cleansing. It was a health factor that is known today. But the spiritual meaning was understood then. If you just turn over a few pages in the book of Leviticus, you'll find, first of all, God gave the law, he said, in chapter 12, verse 3, and in the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And then, turning over a few more pages to the 26th chapter, verse 41, he says this, If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity. So that it had a spiritual meaning then, and it does for us today. Paul says to the Colossians, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And then again in Philippians, the third chapter, verse 3, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So that here was a great spiritual meaning here, but it was according to the Mosaic law, and it identified him with the nation Israel. Now we are told that he was brought to the temple by his mother and Joseph in order to be dedicated. In verse 22 I read, And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now, we have here his dedication, and it could not be done until the time of the purification of the mother. Now, this is without doubt a very interesting law that God gave, and that is 
God says, and I'm turning back again to the 12th of Leviticus. I do not want to be tedious, but this is very important. Verses 6, it says, And when the days of our purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, there are those that have criticized this law. They said it reflects on womanhood. It doesn't reflect on womanhood. After all, what was it that gave womanhood a status in the world? It's been the Word of God. And actually, instead of reflection, it is a recognition of the fact that this woman now is dedicated unto God. And I don't know that women are much farther along today than they were back then. A woman complained not long ago. She says the trouble with being a woman these days is you've got to look like a girl, dress like a boy, think like a man, and work like a dog. That's the modern woman today. I'm not sure that womanhood's very much more emancipated than they were in the nation Israel. Now, the very wonderful thing is that she was to be reminded that sin had been transmitted to the offspring. It was the proof of what David had said. In sin did my mother conceive me. Now, she must wait 33 days after the circumcising of the child, and on the 40th day she comes into the temple. And she couldn't bring Jesus in until then. Now, somebody says, but what about Jesus? It says that holy thing. Yes, but may I say to you, she's a sinner. She always was a sinner. And it was not the birth of Jesus that saves her. It was the death of Jesus upon the cross. And her new birth came about at the cross of Christ. Because our Lord, hanging there, looked down and said, Woman, behold thy son. His birth could not save her. His death did save her. And now she has to bring the sacrifice into the temple. And this, to me, is one of the most wonderful things. Will you notice what it says in verse 24 of Luke 2? And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves are two young pigeons. Will you listen to this now? Back in Leviticus, in the 12th chapter, verse 8. Listen to this. And if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons the one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for her and she shall be clean. In giving birth to the Lord Jesus, it did not make her holy. She's not to be worshipped. What a tremendous message is in this fact that on the 40th day, here comes Mary with Jesus into the temple. And you say to her, why are you bringing him here? Aren't you the queen of heaven? Aren't you to be exalted? She says, no, I'm a sinner. And a sinner that was saved by the death of her son upon the cross. But that's not the most wonderful thing. She brings a little turtle dove and the pigeons. And why? Because the Mosaic law says if you're not able to afford a lamb, you bring this. This speaks of the poverty. And may I say to you, and I say it reverently this morning again, Mary had a little lamb. And she did bring a lamb into the temple, but not the sacrifice, because her little lamb will be suspended on a cross and die for the sins of the world. And it'll take that, if you please, to save her. Now, will you notice, when they go into the temple, there's someone there waiting for them. In fact, there were two somebodies. I did not read about the second one. No word is recorded that she said. However, we're told that she spoke. It was Anna, the prophetess. 
Now will you notice, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now Simeon, it says, was righteous. That does not mean he was sinless. It, in the Old Testament, it only meant right with God. And that's the simple meaning of it. It's these theologians today in our seminaries that have made theology so complicated and mysterious. The only thing righteousness means is to be right with God. That's what it means. Now, this man Simeon was right with God. He acknowledged he was a sinner. And he brought the sacrifice that the Mosaic system required, and that made him right with God, because all of that was pointing to the coming of Christ. And when he brought his sacrifice, he was looking for the coming of Christ into the world. He, in fact, the matter is, he recognized that he was coming into the world. Now, will you notice the exact language of Dr. Luke? It was revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, the Lord's Messiah. That is one of the great statements of the Scripture. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, you know that this man is probably the only one who actually helped the infant Jesus in his arms, besides, of course, Mary and Joseph. And this man came into the temple, and he was looking for the coming of the Messiah. And may I say that we have here his nunc dimittis, as it is called, now dismiss thy servant, Lord. But will you notice, and I'd like to lift out of it several things that we have here. What a privilege he had of holding this infant Jesus, who was to be the Savior, as he acknowledges. Now will you notice, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Now, we are told in the Word of God that no man can call Jesus Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Here is a man that has a spiritual discernment given to him of God, and he recognizes that this little baby that's been brought into the temple is the Messiah, that he's to be the Savior of the world. And the very interesting thing is that the way he speaks of it as being the salvation of God. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Even back in the Old Testament where God gave a ritual, religion was never a ritual. Even back in that Old Testament liturgy, which was long and tedious, and I'm thankful today I'm not under that type of thing, even then, God was making it clear to his people that his salvation was a person. Remember, David sang about that. David says, The Lord is my high tower. He is my strength. He's my deliverer. He is my salvation. And you know that's something that a lot of church members don't know today. A great many people today look to a ritual or a church membership, or to themselves. May I say to you this morning that salvation is a person, and that person is Christ, and you either have him or you don't have him. There's no such thing as middle ground. And if you have him, all of these other things, they fall into place, they have a certain degree of importance, but the important thing, the all-important thing, is to have Christ. That's very important as you enter a new year. Do you have him? A little later on, even 
Joseph and his mother Mary will lose him in the crowd. A lot of church members have lost him today. They have got absorbed in these little pots and pans down here and the things of this world, and they've lost sight of him. Salvation is a person. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, and he's holding that little one in his arms, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Now will you notice, he's not through with this, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. It was about two or three weeks ago that I preached on Joseph, the appearance of the angel Gabriel to Joseph. And I think out of over a thousand letters that I got personally at Christmas, only got one ugly letter, and it came from that message. And somebody underlined the verse in Matthew that I emphasize because I think it needs emphasizing, and it's this, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And somebody sent that in and underlined his people and wrote above it, White. And they said that you're guilty of bigotry. Now, if that was the impression that you got that I'm guilty of bigotry, then let's correct it this morning and make it very clear of what this man says. A light to lighten the Gentiles. For all people, everywhere, he is the Savior of the world. And Simeon, yonder in the temple, holding that little baby, recognized that he's the Savior for all people. And as Peter says later, there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. He is the only Savior, but he is a Savior for everybody. May I say to you that I don't want to confine him to one people. He's a Savior for anyone that will turn to him and accept him as Savior. Now will you notice the reaction of Mary and Joseph. And you can well understand that this peasant couple from up at Nazareth, I do not think I'm being unfair to them when I say to you this morning, they were just a couple of country hicks from Nazareth. It was a mean little town. You read its history. It was a mean little town. They had not been away from home very much. Now they've gone into the temple with a little baby. And they're very religious. That's the reason they brought him there. God made no mistake when he picked that two for the role they were to fulfill in his plan and purpose. And notice the reaction. And Joseph and his mother, notice how accurate Luke is. Luke was so afraid that one of these liberal preachers would be asleep when he read up to this point, and he wanted to wake him up. So he said here, and Joseph and his mother. He didn't say his father and mother. He said Joseph and his mother. And that ought to alert you and say, well, why in the world? Wasn't Joseph the father? Go back and read this story. No, Joseph was not the father. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. And now notice that this is a tremendous statement and this morning, of course, we can't go into any detail. But notice now the reaction of Mary to this. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. When the child was born and the shepherds came down, it says she kept all those things in her heart. That was unusual, what had happened. 
And now she goes into the temple 40 days later, and here it happens again. Here is a man by the Spirit of God. He says to her, A sword shall pierce through thine own soul. Now, I think that the minute that Mary said to the angel Gabriel, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, from that moment on she passed under a cloud, and the sword went into her heart. She suffered many years, but she'd never suffered as she did that day when she stood beneath the cross and saw him hanging there and dying for the sins of the world. A sword went through her heart. That was the price she had to pay. And she was willing to pay, for at the beginning she said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Now, this woman Anna merely confirms what Simeon has already said. She too was looking for the coming of God's salvation, and she confirms Simeon's word. Now, we'll leave it right there. The sixth word is a word of hope. A word of expectation. I like that better. It's a word of expectation. And you'll recall that Paul, in writing his own epitaph, he speaks of the fact that he says the time of my departure has come. I've fought a good fight. I've run a good race, he said. He's finished his course. He says, henceforth has laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. Now, there's a difference between loving his appearing and believing he's coming. And there's a vast difference, by the way. A great gulf is fixed between those two. A great many people today are interested in prophecy. But it doesn't affect their lives at all. Here is a man, Simeon, right with God, looking for the coming of the Messiah. Went daily, apparently, into the temple, knowing one of those days he'd be coming. He loved his appearing. Over in Jerusalem, in another area, were scribes. Herod called them in. He said, where is the king of the Jews, to be born. Why, they said, it's easy. We know the Bible. We know the Old Testament. Just like that. They gave the answer. Bethlehem, or Judea, and they quoted the prophecy. But they weren't interested in going and seeing him. There's a lot of difference in knowing prophecy and love his appearing. I can illustrate that with a very homely illustration. When I was a student in seminary, I met a very wonderful preacher by the name of Dr. Bill Anderson, pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Dallas, Texas. He told about how he came into the knowledge of the coming of Christ for his church, the imminent coming of Christ. He said that the Independent Fundamentalist Association of America wrote him, wanted to know if they could use his church for a convention. He didn't know who they were. And so he agreed to let them come in, not knowing what they believed or anything. And the convention began. And as you well know, Dr. Paul Rood was president of that organization. When they had the convention here on the West Coast, I had the privilege of speaking to them. They put a strong emphasis on the premillennial, pre-trib coming of Christ. And so one day, Dr. George Gill who was one of the speakers at the conference, wandered into the study of Dr. Bill Anderson. He sat down. He said, Dr. Anderson, do you believe in the imminent coming of Christ? Dr. Anderson was busy at his desk. He looked up. He said, well, yeah, I think I do. It's in our creed. It's in the Westminster Confession of Faith. I believe it. Sure, I believe it. And Dr. Gill looked at him and said to him, Bill, you believe in the coming of Christ, I love his appearing. And he got up and walked out. And that made Dr. Anderson very angry. He called up his superintendent of the Bible school, called him by his first name. He said, look, will you have lunch with me tomorrow? He said, yes. At the lunch, he said to him, after they had turned in the order, said, look, have you heard these folk that are holding a convention in the church? This man said, no, I haven't. I've been busy. Well, he said, I've been busy too. I haven't heard of him, but he says, you know, 
What this man Gill said to me, he said that I believed in the coming of Christ, but he loved his appearing. And he said, I'm going to study it. He said, i tell you what we'll do. It was on Friday, and he said, now tomorrow, let's both of us get in our study, stay there for 24 hours, and then we'll meet and hear and have lunch together, and we'll study and see what the Bible says. I don't want to hear these fellows. I want to see what the Word of God has to say. So they both went. Dr. Bell went through the Scripture, and they met the next day, and after they turned in the order, Dr. Anderson said to him, said, what would you find out? And this man, tears came in his eyes, said, I found out he's coming again. And Dr. Anderson, who had a very tender heart, began to weep, and he said, I found out he's coming again, and I have not emphasized this. And they used to criticize Dr. Anderson because he preached on the second coming so much. He said, the reason I preach on it so much now is for 20 years I neglected it, and I'm preaching on it now. I have never met anyone that helped in his heart the longing for the coming of Christ as that man did. May I say to you, Simeon had the expectation in his heart of the coming of Christ into the world. And he's come now, but he said he's coming again. Do you believe it, or do you love his appearing? Now, very briefly, I want to take another group of those who arrive late, and that, of course, the wise men. And For the seventh word, we go to them, and their word is a big question. They came into Jerusalem saying, where is he that's born king of the Jews? And when they came in and asked a question, I want to tell you they raised a great many questions. And these questions go something like this. Who were they? Where did they come from? Why did they come? How did they come? When did they come? And a mystery surrounds the wise men. All I know is that out of that Oriental East with its teeming millions, where fabulous wealth on one hand and abject poverty on the other didn't walk hand in hand because they had nothing to do with each other, but they at least rubbed shoulders, where plenty and penury abounded, And there was dissatisfaction among those multitudes. And these men come looking for one who's born king of the Jews. When did they arrive? Well, they arrived at least 40 days after the birth of Jesus. And Herod, you will recall, made the statement to kill the children of two years and under. And why? because that was the time he inquired of the wise men when the star appeared. So that somewhere between 40 days after he's born, up to two years, in that space, the wise men came. And we read that when they arrived, they went into the house. You see, when they dedicated Jesus in Jerusalem, they returned back to Bethlehem, and now there is a house for them, and that's where the wise men came. It's only in church pageants that you have the shepherds coming down one aisle and the wise men coming down the other aisle at the same time. That didn't happen at all. They came at altogether different intervals, and I believe that it was at least a year afterward. Because you must remember, they did not come through the friendly skies of United. They came over the burning sands of a hostile country. And that's the way they had to come together and come into the land. And Jesus is now back in Bethlehem. He's not in a stable. And where did they get the information? Two places they could have gotten it. I do not know that this is accurate, but I do know they could have gotten it. The prophecy of Balaam was given in the land of Moab in that land. It identified a star and a scepter. It says a star will come out of Jacob and a scepter. And the question is, where is he that's born king of the Jews? And then Daniel, in his 70 weeks, puts down a time period. Actually, the first coming of Christ was pretty well outlined as to time. 
His second coming for the church is not outlined. But the minute that takes place, you'll know when he's coming to the earth to establish his kingdom. Until then, we have no dates or times for anything at all. So that these men, they come out of the east. They come out with a question. And that question is, where is he that's born king of the Jews? And there weren't three of them. They must have been 300 of them. I don't think three wise men would have excited Jerusalem and would have made old Herod fearful. I think 300 of them converging on Jerusalem would have made a great impression indeed. And I'm sure that it must have been a very large number. I made that statement down at the San Diego Bible class. I got a Christmas card from down there. It had three wise men on it. And a little note underneath, it says, the other 297 will be long later. And may I say to you that you can't get a Christmas card. It's got 300 on them. And what would you do with it? Send it by parcel post. You couldn't put them all on there. And then I have another question to ask. Who told you they came on camels? Oh, that... I saw it in my Christmas card. Sure you did. That's where a great many people get their information. Bible doesn't say they came on camels. And by the way, how do you know Mary came on a little donkey? Wouldn't it be funny if we got up there someday and found out that Mary came on a camel and the wise men came on little donkeys? And it could well have happened that way. I don't insist on either one because I don't know. But I guess if you're going to make Christmas cards, you've got to put something on there. And you can't put a jet on there. You've got to put something. And so they had to put something. But these men come out of that mysterious east, and they come with this question, where is he that's born king of the Jews? Now, they were seekers. They were inquirers. The seventh word is a word of witness. Let me put it like this, evangelism. That's the word. The heralding the message, if you please. That is the word. We today have now looked at seven words. That was first of all the word of faith. When the angel Gabriel first broke through to Zacharias, he did not believe. The angel said, you're dumb until John the Baptist is born. It's a word of faith. And Mary said at the second appearance, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, and obedience is the second word. And then Joseph, without saying a word, recognizing what a tremendous responsibility is put upon him, what courage he needed, what patience he needed, and the word is faithful. This man was faithful. God knew he was faithful, and he could depend upon him. And then the fourth word, And the fifth word are both worship. That John the Baptist, little fella in the womb of Elizabeth, leaps and Elizabeth then worships this little one. She was the first one to worship him. And then we have the angels and the shepherds coming down, the word of worship. Now we have two more words. Expectation and evangelism. And... I think this places evangelism in its proper perspective. It puts it where it belongs. May I say that I understand my business is to do the thing Paul said to do, preach the word. My orders are very simple. Preach the word. And I'm in that area. I want to be very careful. I heard the story about a jet plane on which there was a preacher, and next to him sat a woman very nervous, and they hit a very severe storm. And she said, oh my, I know we're going to crash. Can't you do something to save us? And he said to her, says, I'm sorry, but I can't do anything. I'm in sales, not management. And friends... I want to say this morning, I'm not even in sales, and I'm not in management, that's for sure. A preacher is sometimes called a salesman. No, I'm no salesman. The worst thing ever said about me here, and there's been some bad ones, but this is the worst one. The worst thing is ever said, a vista went out here one time and said, 
say he ought to be selling automobiles. May I say to you, I couldn't sell automobiles. I'm no salesman. My business is to preach the word. I do not create a thirst. I think church members ought to create the thirst. We hear so much about drawing preachers. What we need are drawing church members. I was thrilled last Sunday morning. Several of the members of this church came by and said, I want you to meet my neighbors. I brought my neighbors to church. May I say to you, drawing church members. That's what we need today. My business is to preach the word of God. I can't create a thirst or a taste. I can only declare the Word of God. I am speaking to unsaved people who are dead in trespasses and sins. And my friend, the only way you can respond is if the Spirit of God speaks to your heart. And if he does, you ought to answer it. You ought to follow the prompting that's given there. We used to call the room where the unsaved went to the inquiry room. I think that's what it ought to be called today. We now have the lovely term, the prayer room. It's not a prayer room. It should be the inquiry room. Where is he that's born king of the Jews? My business is to declare the word of God. And the word of God, I'm told, is a mirror. And all I do is to hold up the mirror. And if you can see yourself as you are in God's sight, lost sinner. Then you want to come to this one as the wise men came. I got a card that has this on it. Wise men still adore him. Yes, they do. (laughs) Are you a wise man who's come here this morning? Have you tried the fountains of this world that are not fountains but poor broken cisterns and found out that they do not slack your thirst? May I say that he said, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He says, whosoever will may come, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I'm the doer. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Simeon said, mine eyes have seen." Thy salvation. Have you seen him? He's a savior. No longer a baby, but the glorified man at God's right hand today. A savior. And if you can see him, and if you're thirsty, he says, come and drink. That's the invitation. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we truly thank Thee this morning that He came 1,900 years ago. We thank Thee for this fascinating and exciting story that records His birth into the world. Of those words spoken before He was born, those words spoken when He was born, those words spoken after He was born all gathered together to tell out who he is and also to tell us who we are and what we need. And we would pray this morning, if there is in our midst, those that are hungry and thirsting after righteousness, who long today to have a heart and life and mind right with God, We pray even right now they may turn to this wonderful Savior and accept him and receive him, that he came to this earth in order that we might come to him. Make him real, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen.